Hey, welcome back everyone. First off, some breaking news. Now, the news on the floods is finally receiving some broader coverage in the global news outlets, and the Three Gorges Dam has once again come into focus. A retired Indian colonel published satellite images on July 10th that are now making some rounds, and they appear to show that the CCP has opened all floodgates on the dam, which we reported before. But he wrote this on Twitter, quote, Why did China open the floodgates of Three Gorges Dam prematurely? He notes the opening was before the CCP issued a warning, before the Yangtze River was flooded on July 2nd, and he noted, most importantly, the move may have flooded Wuhan just before an inspection by a representative from the World Health Organization was set to arrive. And his note on that, about the flooding of Wuhan, this was potentially made worse by the dam opening. And it's in context of the WHO sending a team to investigate the origins of the new coronavirus, the CCP virus. Given that Wuhan was the epicenter of the virus, and these virus research labs in that city have become a key focus as a possible origin of the virus. Now, the WHO investigation has come under some scrutiny, however, as we mentioned previously, due to reports that it is not planning to investigate the labs and will instead act only to, according to the UK Independent, quote, advance the understanding of animal hosts for COVID-19 and ascertain how the disease jump between animals and humans. In other words, while WHO is looking to, say, investigate the origins of the virus, according to these reports, they're only investigating a possible animal origin. In other words, not the laboratories. Meanwhile, Chinese state media are attempting to defend the CCP's actions around the Three Gorges Dam. You might remember reports saying, where we reported, that they opened up these floodgates and flooded downstream towns and so on, and not warning people ahead of time, possibly caused a lot of deaths by doing so. And the CCP is now covering this up through state-run media by saying the dam, quote, has done its best. NetEase reported, quote, the Three Gorges Dam has done its best. Please stop accusing it. Tencent reported, quote, I'm sorry, the Three Gorges Dam has done its best. In other words, they're repeating the same line, which usually means the CCP had something to do with that line coming out. Now, the content of the articles was similar as well. And the move, what they're doing here, shifts the blame from the CCP and its actions to the dam itself. And in addition to this, the water levels at the Three Gorges Dam and the Yangtze River have exceeded their warning limits. This is combined with the CCP's claims that, quote, the dam has done its best. Now think of those together. This is deepening concerns that the dam may fail, which is one of the big, big concerns in China right now. And on the waters on the Yangtze River, they've reached 95 feet, making the water levels the fourth highest in known history at that river, according to data released by the Yangtze River Hydrology Network. Now, the average ground elevation of Wuhan City is around 79 feet. So taking these two together, that means the water levels in parts of this city could be about the height to submerge the first floor of a building. And when it comes to disaster relief, meanwhile, the CCP is giving very little relief to people suffering from these floods. This is raising concerns over the well-being of the 37 million people in 27 provinces who are now known to have been affected by this. Now, for its aid program, the Chinese authorities are giving less than 10 renminbi, or about $1.50 per person. And then it's not even going to the people. I'll explain this. Now, this is taking place as many people have lost their homes, their farms, their possessions, and many are struggling for food. And it takes place while the CCP is claiming its market is booming and is trying to draw in large amounts of foreign investment. So in other words, while the CCP is claiming the country is you know, jumping back, things are going great, they're having flooding in 27 provinces, tens of millions of people suffering from it, and they're giving $1.50 per person for relief. Now, its state-run Xinhua News Agency reported on July 12th that around 1.25 million people are in need of emergency support. That's out of the 37 million affected. It says also 8.7 million acres of crops were affected, 28,000 homes collapsed, and the economic loss has been around 82 billion yuan, or around $11.7 billion. The CCP is known for giving lower estimates on data like this. They do it frequently. But Xinhua stated for relief the CCP would give just 309 million yuan, meaning that if all the 37.89 million people who were affected received relief, they get less than 10 yuan each, again, about $1.50. In addition, however, the money will not go to the affected citizens themselves. And so even though it's so little given to each person technically, that money will not even go to them. It will instead be used exclusively for restoration and construction of facilities. 
So in other words, the people themselves will not receive direct relief from the funds. And even if they did, it would amount to extremely little. And this is again, as many of them have been displaced and are in need of basic supplies. And on top of this, there are signs that China may be facing pork shortages. You might remember some of the news talking about potential food shortages in China even before the floods took place, even just from the pandemic. Now, pork prices have risen for six consecutive weeks. This is amid the heavy rains and floods in central and southern China. Now, a pound of pork right now sells for about 25 yuan per pound, which is a price increase of over 15 percent. Authorities claim prices have gone up due to increased demand and because of challenges they're having in transportation. And over the past year, pork prices have risen by between 81 percent and 90 percent, depending where you're at in the country. Now for some broader news, there is new evidence showing the CCP has launched programs to influence British politics using individuals, quote, tasked with grooming foreign elites. Now reports say these agents have met with five prime ministers, including Boris Johnson, David Cameron, Tony Blair, Theresa May, and Gordon Brown. Now this is according to the Daily Mail, and the main individual that was recently exposed in these operations is the head of an organization called the Chinese People's Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries. Now these findings are outlined in the new book, Hidden Hand, which details CCP operations to infiltrate British politics, and which also details the 48 Group Club, which is an alleged networking club used by the CCP to make political connections with senior politicians. So what are we seeing here? This is the United Front Work Department in action. It's what a lot of my reporting has been on over the years, as a matter of fact. And when you hear the word friendship association or, you know, friendship society, uh, the Chinese Communist Party has all kinds of organizations like this. They will oftentimes use these friendship societies and so on to gain influence within, say, circles of business, academia, uh, circles of, say, even student groups, businesses, politicians, you name it. Now again, I'll briefly explain the United Front. It's, it's a branch of the Chinese Communist Party that the CCP uses to create a, quote, united front line in other countries. In other words, through the United Front, it can create, say, pseudo-Chinese provinces in, say, American cities or other foreign cities. And the way it works is it uses the local Chinese consulate, it's the, say, local governing office, and it goes to the different organizations that work as the, say, unofficial governing bodies of those communities. And these friendship associations, when you see them, that should set off a red alarm. Because a lot of times these friendship associations, as it's being exposed right now, are involved in CCP programs for subversion. Now, in addition to this, a Los Angeles City Council member, Jose Huizar, was arrested on RICO charges, alleging he agreed to accept at least $1.5 million in illicit benefits, which heavily involved Chinese sources. Now, the affidavit on these charges states, quote, the federal investigation has revealed that Huizar operated a pay-to-play scheme, utilizing and commodifying the powerful council seat of CD14, whereby he solicited and accepted financial benefits from international, primarily Chinese, and domestic developers with projects in the city in exchange for favorable official actions. And so what are we seeing here again? This is an example again of the United Front, at least in some regards, but also on a broader scale in regards to the Chinese Communist Party's programs for influencing and compromising politicians. Now, the Chinese Communist Party has large-scale programs for doing this, the United Front Work Department being one of the main branches for this. And so this ties into how the CCP views espionage activities differently from how the U.S. would view them, for example. So in the U.S., if you want to talk about motivations for espionage, you're talking about mice, money, ideology, uh, co coercion, ego, essentially. For the Chinese Communist Party, it's not like that. For the Chinese Communist Party, they look for moral flaws, lust, greed, power, you know, these types of things. So, for example, maybe if your thing is lust, you'll go to China, you'll go on this big business trip, maybe you'll have a nice, you know, drinking party with these different executives. You go to your hotel room, there'll be a young girl there waiting for you, possibly, and there'll be cameras set up in the room. That person will be blackmailed for the rest of their life. One of the things they'll do, for example, with individuals working in the United Front, one of the ways they launder money to them, according to my own sources I've interviewed on this, individuals who are part of this system, they say they'll have them, for example, establish an import-export business. And let's say they order, say, a million dollars worth of goods from China to sell in the United States. On the Chinese side, they'll charge them half of that. 
on the U.S. side, on the books, it'll look like it's the full price sometimes. And so doing so, the CCP will have paid them half a million dollars. Or it'll give them just a huge discount. But that discount will be the payment in disguise. And this is how they say bribe officials, bribe individuals running businesses a lot of times on the low level. It could also be, for example, joint venture offers. It could be, for example, executive positions for you or your family member. These are common, common tactics of the CCP when it comes to exploiting and influencing foreign politics. When it comes to, for example, fame, another big one they do. If you're a professor, let's, now imagine you're this college professor and you, know, you, you work at a big university, for example, hypothetically, right? You work at a big university, you've done research your whole life, you write all these long scientific papers and maybe three people read them, if that. And you feel that you're underappreciated, you feel that you have more knowledge than is being recognized by the world. And suddenly you get an invitation to go speak in China. They, you go there, they literally roll out a red carpet for you and you have very well-educated Chinese students asking you very interesting questions about your work. Then they start asking things like this. Oh, you know, you're so smart, you're so kind. Why are Americans so hostile to China? Why does America fear China's rise? These are the kinds of questions they'll begin asking that individual. And as the person begins rationalizing it in that state where they're already somewhat compromised, where they're open to being compromised, they will gradually move their loyalties. And the CCP will use that over time to begin influencing that individual. This is why you have a lot of academics for right now, a lot of professors right now, getting, say, you know, pre charges pressed against them for being involved in different programs the CCP has for that, like the Thousand Talents program. This is exactly how they do it. And so again, Chinese Communist Party does these programs on a large, large scale. If the Trump administration really did want to go after it, we would very likely see a whole lot of politicians get wrapped up in this. We would see a whole lot of business people get wrapped up in this. We'd see a whole lot of academics and professors get wrapped up in this. Possibly even journalists, possibly students, possibly government workers, because they target all of these areas through these programs. And meanwhile, while businesses are pulling out of Hong Kong, many countries are continuing to head to China to do business. A poll from the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong found that around 35% of companies in Hong Kong are considering leaving over the new national security laws. And so we are seeing a business pull out from Hong Kong. But at the same time this is happening, U.S. financial institutions are continuing to head to China regardless of the threats from the CCP, regardless of its various uses of espionage now being exposed on a broader level, and regardless of its various human rights abuses that it's even being sanctioned for right now. Now on this, many companies operate in China. A lot of these big corporations are transnational corporations. A lot of these big businesses will have offices in China. And as we see things begin to shift, yes, some of them are pulling out of, for example, Hong Kong. We do see that taking place. Some of them might try to stay there. And now, if they are there, they very likely knew beforehand about the risks of operating in China. They would have already said, you know, had to have gone through this process of saying, do we want to be involved in this country that, has, that you know, for example, has human rights abuses against religious believers, that tears down churches, that puts Muslims in slave camps, that harvests organs from living Falun Gong practitioners? Do we want to be in a country that does these types of things? If they're operating in China, they've already gone through that thought process and they said yes, despite the fact that they know the CCP say monitors and censors the entire internet, despite the fact that it does all these different things that are considered unethical you know, by most standards, at least on the international level. But they're pulling out of China now, you know, very likely because one, it's bad optics. Two, some of them could face charges from the CCP through this new national security law. And three, again, if they don't play by the CCP's games with it, they themselves could face additional charges based on that. For example, if you have an employee who, let's say, posted online about supporting the democracy protests, that person could be charged with terrorism in China. But at the same time as this, these investment firms, these different companies, these different financial companies are going into China. They're pouring money into China. And they're doing so as the CCP's state-run media has been publishing stories trying to lure them to China to do so. Now, this could blow up in their faces. A lot of different financial advisory groups and different websites are warning that it may be a bubble. And we've seen this before in China, but one of the big hopes they have is the rebuilding of China based on, say, companies having gone out of business and, say, new 
openings for creating businesses in China. The CCP recently made some revisions to its laws, which would make that easier. You're talking about mass flooding through southern and central China. You're talking about a lot of disasters. You're talking about things being shaken up in many different ways. And they see an opportunity to get, in, to get involved in these infrastructure projects in cooperation with the CCP. And so they are weighing their losses and gains. They're thinking, they're thinking essentially, uh, maybe it's worth it if I go there and pour my money into it. And also in China right now, we're seeing different statements, even from CCP leaders, even from individuals who are pretty influential in China, warning about the economic state of the country. And so possibly, even though, yes, these companies are pouring money into China, they might be pouring it down the drain, essentially. They might be jumping into a trap. We'll have to see how this plays out. Now, moving on, you might remember the story we had on here about this bus crash in China. And the police are now saying that this bus driver intentionally drove the bus into a reservoir, killing 21 people. Now, this confirms my own analysis, you might remember. We, the video of this, you can see the bus, it's driving, and it takes a very sharp turn, drives through this barricade, and drives into the water. Individuals say the bus sank immediately when it hit the water. Now, this ties to a bigger issue in China. One of the reasons why I said this does appear to be intentional is because we've seen other incidents like this in China. There was, for example, this other incident where a bus driver was on the bus and a lady was hitting him with her shoe, you know, striking him, and out of vengeance, turns the bus sharply and drives the bus off a bridge, killing many people on board. This has happened in China. And so what are you seeing? The Chinese Communist Party destroyed the cultural foundations of China. It destroyed the traditional moral fabric of the country. And what, what do you have? One of the main goals of these communist systems, right, is to establish power, establish absolute power. And if you want to establish absolute power, you need to get rid of anything that would challenge your power. And if people recognize higher values, if people recognize, for example, a belief in God, I mean, of course, all communist systems persecute just about every main religion, right? If people recognize a power higher than the government, the government will never have full power over the people. And if the government does things that are considered immoral based on this recognition of higher values, the people will revolt against it. And so we've seen this, for example, with the Soviet Union. We saw this with a lot of the Soviet bloc countries where the people who revolted against the communist system were often the religious people. The CCP took a lesson from that, and it heavily, heavily persecutes all religions in China, all the ones that, it's not, that are not directly under its control, for example. And what happened with that? There are two types of order in society. There's internal self-restraint, the ability of an individual to make moral choices on their own. And that is rooted in your beliefs, that's rooted in your culture, and that's rooted in the values you were taught growing up. The CCP destroyed that in China. And it instilled a new form of morality, the social justice. You know, social justice was coined in 1967 by Mao Zedong. The idea is morals in line with government policy. If you follow government policy, you are politically correct. That is how it's interpreted. And if you go against government policy, you are not politically correct. At the time of Mao Zedong, if he did so, he could be killed. The CCP did that. They destroyed the moral order of the society, and they created this state order. But state order can only govern people down to a certain extent. And when it comes to people getting in fights with each other, when it comes to things like this, they will do whatever they see fit in the moment. And you see things like this in China. Now, not to say this doesn't happen in other countries, but for the CCP, this does tie into the bigger issue of social stability. One of the factors of this state government system, where you know, state power is essentially the only fabric of stability within the country, is that they're only able to create stability down to the level they can monitor people, down to the level that they can watch pe you know, people's every move, which is why the CCP has things like the social credit system, which is why it has social control systems that monitor your every action which is why it has cameras in classrooms, for example, for kids that monitor their facial expressions to see whether they approve or disapprove of the things they're being taught. This is why it does things like that, right? And so the Chinese people are being monitored like this because the Chinese Communist Party does not trust their ability to make moral judgments. And if the CCP has taken over the moral order of the society and taught them a moral order based essentially on immorality, then you have things like this take place. That's what we're watching right now. Now, moving on, former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon is claiming that scientists from the Wuhan virus lab have defected to the West. And he's claiming these defectors are talking to intelligence services 
in the United States and the UK about how the new coronavirus, the CCP virus, allegedly spread from a Chinese laboratory. Now, we'll have to see what comes out from this. This follows the recent stories about the female virologist who just recently defected from China and who has been exposing the CCP's cover-up of this virus. There is no protection for both doctors and the patient and the uh, common people. And also, uh, the government doesn't allow people to release such information. Hospital doctors are scared, but they cannot talk. CDC staff are scared. I feel very disappointed, but I already know this would happen because I know the corruption among this kind of international organization like WHO to China government, to China Communist Party government. Now, when it comes to these laboratories, one of the big arguments made about this, a lot of the big media, for example, they say it's conspiracy theory to suggest the virus might have been man-made. And they use that to write off any possible discussion about a possible lab origin of this virus. But lab origin does not necessarily mean man-made. They try to make these things synonymous, that you can't talk about lab origin without saying you believe it's man-made. And so they try to create this, say, equivalence, that you can't separate the two, that if it's lab origin, it means man-made. No. These virus laboratories in China, they were storing thousands of viruses exactly like this. One of the individuals, Dr. Shi Zhengli, the bat woman of China, is in Wuhan, the epicenter of this virus. And she was going around to different parts of the world collecting bat coronaviruses very much like the one we're facing now. And there have even been different reports, including very recently, pointing that some of the viruses that they had in that laboratory, which, which the laboratory had written about publicly, very closely fit the description of the virus the world is now facing. And now on this, the WHO, the World Health Organization, is conducting investigations on the virus origin. But news is coming out now that the WHO investigative team will not be visiting the Wuhan laboratory. So the Times is reporting this, quote, the World Health Organization, WHO, is under fire from scientists over indications that its planned mission to China to investigate the origins of COVID-19, this new coronavirus, will not visit a secretive laboratory that researches coronaviruses in Wuhan, the city at the center of the outbreak. And so what's the significance of this? Now, as I mentioned before, the Chinese Communist Party was facing pressure from all countries around the world, United States, different countries in the EU, the UK, Australia, you name it, different countries pushing back against the CCP and calling for independent investigations into the origin of the virus. The Chinese Communist Party lashed out of these different countries, say, for example, retaliating against Australia with business deals and so on, for calling for these investigations. And it said it would not allow any third party into China to conduct investigations, that no group internationally would be led into China. But it said it would allow the WHO to investigate. And the WHO is being criticized right now in many parts of the world for being too close to the CCP. The reason, for example, the United States just pulled out of the WHO and previously cut funding to the WHO from the United States was because the WHO could not demonstrate independence from the CCP. And now we see these news reports saying that as the WHO is being led into China to conduct these investigations, it is not planning, allegedly based on these reports, it is not planning to investigate this laboratory, which has been the main focus as a possible origin of this virus. And this is also taking place among another phenomena right now, which is people are allegedly defecting, at least one we know for sure, and many others according to Steve Bannon. We can't confirm it, he would be the one who would know this. But you have new information coming out suggesting that there was a possible lab origin. Again, lab origin doesn't necessarily mean man-made, but evidence coming out on that is the possible origin. At the same time the WHO is going there, very likely to say otherwise, because they're not even planning to look into the laboratory, according to these reports. Now, in other news, over 600,000 Hong Kongers have voted against the new national security laws. And this is a demonstration by the Hong Kong people that they do not support the CCP's new laws, which have effectively ended autonomy in Hong Kong. Now, with that said, folks, again, we broadcast Monday through Friday, five days a week, so be sure to tune in. Also, if you want to support this channel, we do have a Patreon. You can find the link to it in the description below. And also, every Sunday, I do a live Q&A for our Patreon supporters. So if you'd like to join, please support this channel. Also, if you can, you know, support us in many other ways. Like and subscribe. Tell a friend or family about this channel. It really means a lot to us. And with that said, folks, please take care of yourselves, stay healthy, and stay free. Mm -hmm.